In this video, we are driving the former world's fastest Cobra Mustang for the first time in over 20 years, or we're gonna die trying. Okay, that's a little extreme, but I already know that I've succeeded because I took the DeLorean into the future to find out. All right guys, I've transported myself into the future around the time that Max should be editing the video after I drive it. I, I can hear it. All right, to make this future dream of driving this Cobra a reality, we have a ton of good old fashioned mechanical work to do, including new fuel lines. So here's my fuel line building station, EV batteries, van transmissions, and Mercedes-Benz sunroof grease included. And the reason we need new fuel lines is because we discovered that basically every single one of them is leaking on this car, including the ones near the gas tank, which I did replace when I first bought this car because it had a hole in it, but we are gonna be taking that down. Now, naturally, you know, I put like 10 gallons of fuel in this tank, so this is gonna be fun. I'm gonna try and just lower it as much as possible without actually removing it. It's just one line. We need to get off the top. This is all that holds it in. Okay, I'm gonna really try and cheat this line out of here. Oh! Don't fall and kill me. We're gonna fuel all over my shop. Actually, that would clean my shop pretty well. It's coming down. Hasn't done anything scary yet. I can totally sneak in here without lowering the tank anymore. Then I don't have to disconnect the fuel filler. I did have to give myself some additional height though, standing on a wheel. And yes, those bad boys are going on in this video. So this is just the feed to the pump. So very low pressure. So they didn't actually put an AN line at the end of this. They just clamped it on to a barb fitting. Oh man, that is on there pretty good. Come on, okay. There's that. Now we can disconnect it from here. Okay, there's a line coming off the pump. And if you guys are wondering, there are siphon tubes from this custom fuel sender that go all the way to the bottom of the tank. So the tank is higher than the fuel pump and it's able to get all the fuel from the bottom. So what we're gonna be using on the Cobra is exactly what it had, which is steel braided rubber nitrile line. So you can see there is a rubber liner inside, and then this is gonna be a lot more heat resistant because it has the steel braid, and this will hold a ton of pressure as well. This is just much stronger than regular fuel hose, but we need to get this fitting onto that line. So we're gonna start by unscrewing this end. These are really cool. They're magnetic jaws for your vise to hold the fittings so you don't scratch them. All right, I'm gonna show you how to do this according to all the instructions for these types of fittings. And I'll show you the Alex way a little bit later. Use a little bit of silicone spray here on the end just to make this easier. And this will fray a little bit. If you use a flat blade screwdriver, you can kind of just tuck it on in there. And from there, you're just going to Turn it and push at the same time. There is a lip that will stop you so you know you've gone all the way right about there is perfect. And then we're just gonna mark the end so we know it hasn't moved when we put the second piece in. And then what they tell you to do is put this fitting on the top. We lubricate it, of course, with Mercedes-Benz sunroof grease. That is not in any instructions, but you know I love my Mercedes-Benz sunroof grease. So then you push it on, that's great. And some of these instructions say to turn this with the hose. Don't get me wrong, you could do it. It's just kind of annoying. All right, there we go. Imagine if you had like 20 feet of this. Say they have you putting the hose on from the top. Weird. But anyway, I will finish turning this. Then when we build another hose in a few minutes, I'll show you what I do. Once it gets tight, you can just use a wrench and they do sell special wrenches so you don't scratch up this anodized coating. But if you're just careful with the right size, you can use a normal wrench. And once it gets tight, and just stops, you don't want it to go too crazy. You're good, right there is good. Double check that your Sharpie line hasn't moved. If this line was out here, we'd know that the hose was pushed out and it's probably not gonna seal well, but this is good to go. That, that's all it takes, guys. I like to get the fitting on there first if you're matching up an existing line to replicate so you know exactly how long it's going to be. Right about there. So we have our mark right here, but before we cut, we're gonna put 
some black electrical tape right in the center. And this is gonna hold the steel braid so it doesn't fray out. I like to use these jaws again, just bring it pretty close, tighten it up. There are a few different ways to cut a stainless steel line. The idea here is that you don't want any fraying. So you could literally use a hacksaw if you don't have any power tools, but I like a cutoff wheel. There we go. And now when we take our tape off, you'll see there's no fraying whatsoever. Now in this particular situation, we're not gonna be using another AN fitting at this end. This is going over a barb. This isn't traditionally how this type of fuel hose is used, but I'm not gonna reinvent the wheel. This is a very low pressure system and they had it like this for a long time. So we're just going to go ahead and slide this guy right over and we'll tighten it up. And this isn't going anywhere. If this was the pressure side, I would take this fitting out and have an AN fitting welded in, but we don't need to do that. This is gonna be totally fine. And then we'll just slide the return on as well. Again, another very low pressure system. With that done, we can go right back up with this fuel tank. We didn't need to take it out, which is huge. Go right back in place. Fuel straps going in. And transjack coming down. All right. This is fun. It's fun making fuel lines, guys. Let me tell you, it's very satisfying. Look at this beautiful, beautiful new fitting. No more leak. So just because they're steel braided doesn't mean that they won't deteriorate and dry rot over time. Beneath the skin is just rubber hose that dries up. We'll snug this up. All right, that's done. Hang on, before we get to more Cobra goodness, I gotta take a quick look at a car for my neighbors. So this would be his kid's first car. It's an 07 BMW. And of course I have my Carly OBD diagnostic and coating tool already plugged in. I wanna give this car a once over, make sure it's a good one for them. So we'll run some diagnostics, 22 codes in 19 different computers. All right, what do we got in the engine? So this car has an active exhaust and it's throwing a code for an exhaust gas flap activation. And what's nice is smart mechanic. So this is something I really love with with Carly, you don't have to be a trained mechanic to diagnose and possibly fix your own car at home and save a ton of money. It'll give you potential consequences and possible errors. So fuse could be defective, wiring harness, or the flap itself. They have a used car mileage check. So right now it is checking the VIN in multiple different control units because even with modern cars, scammers can change the mileage in the cluster. So Carly ran its scan, it's detected no tampering, and it's checked the VIN in multiple different control units to confirm. This is obviously a super important tool to have before you go and buy any used car. Another cool feature with Carly that's available on some cars is convenience feature coding. So there are seven control units on this car and if you go into each one of them, there are literally dozens and dozens of things that you can code. For example, you could change the brightness of your angel eyes. You can turn on and off different features depending on what country you're in or want to pretend that you're in. You can also modify when it tells you you're low on fuel. There are literally hundreds of options on some cars. I've also used Carly to program factory lap timers into the instrument clusters of Audis. And you can even activate active exhaust right from your cell phone using Carly as well. Now you can use the Carly scanner and their totally free app on any car with an OBD2 port but you're gonna wanna click on my link down below to check out what Carly can do specifically for your car and see if it's advanced features like coding and manufacturer level diagnostics are available for you. Now there are some features that require a yearly subscription, but the best part is if you guys click on my link down below and use my code legit24, you're gonna save 15% off your very own Carly connected car OBD scanner and coding tool. Now this is a very limited time off Offer, so definitely take advantage and with that let's get back to the Cobra. Next we have a line that's just slightly longer it goes all the way from the fuel filter over there and alongside the entire car it's run along these brake lines and it goes all the way to the engine. Now we'll get this super long line off of my fuel filter uh, we actually have to spin the fuel filter here because this fitting doesn't free spin I think it's just corroded. There we go. There's only a couple fasteners for this line. <laughs> That's one of them. And then it is zip tie central. Yeah. We'll definitely be able to make this line shorter. They looped it right here. I took it back. They had this clamped in in a few spots. That's not too bad. 
Uh, we can just pull this through. And you know, ironically, this is the high pressure side of the system and this had one little leak where it actually had rubbed onto the body of the car. But other than that, it was fine. It's kind of crazy. The low pressure side was leaking a lot, but I'm not taking any chances. We're replacing it all. This is where the feed line goes under the hood to the back of the rail, which I believe from the factory is the return. I think they switched it. So that's that. And then we'll leave this adapter fitting on the rail. Now we can pull this through. There we go. That sounds cool. Get out. There we go. That's a lot of hose right there. Going in the pile. Oh, wait a minute, hold on. I, I need to measure that still. Hang on, sorry. Soon you will go to the cemetery of Cobra parts. You guys wanna see something kinda cool? This is all the garbage wiring from the last video. And here's the Cobra cemetery with its blown up engine. Sure, there's gonna be more. Now, if you guys have always wondered what city has the best deep dish pizza, it's Chicago. And if you've also wondered what the difference is between the black braided hose and the stainless hose, let me explain. On the left is PTFE hose or polytetrafluorethylene hose. Say that one time in a row. This is most commonly referred to as Teflon, but all Teflon is is a trademark name for polytetra, whatever that word is. It's like calling all tissue paper clean. Next. PTFE hose is superior to the original steel over rubber hose design because it can resist more chemicals than rubber. So you can use this for ethanol, fuel, transmission, fluid, and just about anything else that runs through a car. And it also holds a much higher pressure and is more heat resistant too. And so you might be wondering, why am I using this and not this? And it simply boils down to cost and necessity. So the steel braided hose will handle way over 100 PSI of fuel pressure. I'll be running maybe 60, and I also won't be running this car on ethanol fuel, just normal 93 octane. So this is gonna work perfectly fine. And remember the goal with the Cobra isn't max power. This is more of a retro build. So I wanna leave this car as much like it was in the year 2000 when it was the fastest Cobra in the world as possible. So in short, this this is better than this, but not always needed. And these red and blue connectors are so 20 years ago and I love it. All right, I put a fitting, I put a fitting on here and I'm about to line this up on the ground and make our mark. This is a 20 foot roll and the car is about 15 feet long. So we should be good. With these two matched up, normally I'd cut it right here, but they had so much excess. I'm just gonna trim just a couple of inches off. So we'll mark it right here. That should be good. I've right, wrapped this up in tape. Wear, wear face protection, guys. That was not overkill at all. I don't feel like getting my razor blade right now. Right, let's cut this guy in half. We're all professional braided hose makers now. This is so satisfying to do, and I wanna show you guys kind of a, I don't know if this is a trick, just a smarter way. So when I made the first one, I showed you what most of the instructions say to do. Let me just show you what I do. I just hold this thing on here, and I put my thumb right here to push down on the steel braided part, and then I don't use a vise typically. I just kinda manhandle it and twist it on like this, and bam. It brings that hose up right away. And all the instructions, they want you to clamp this piece in and then screw this in from the top. It doesn't make any sense. What I do instead is I clamp this. Sunroof grease. Just hold this hose nice and firm and screw this in. You can get it mostly in by hand. Then you turn this guy and not the end with the hose. That's annoying. And at this point, if you did this right, this isn't gonna push out at all, but you can put your hand here just to feel it. Make sure it's not coming out. You don't want that. Then we tighten it up out of the vise and we're done. Seriously, very easy to do all of this. Don't be intimidated. I was for a while, but once you just get into it, it's easy. Now with our brand new fitting that will now swivel, we can screw that on to the adapter that they used for this standard fuel filter. And I'll leave this loose until it's all the way up front. We can kind of angle this guy like so. Very factory-like. And by factory, I mean whoever put this car together. We'll go ahead and use all of their mounting provisions since they're already all drilled in anyway. This is hilarious. Look at all this 20-something-year-old rubber. So cool to see on the Trans Am. 
I left this for over a decade just to see how thick I could get it. It was before YouTube, but I got it probably sticking out to about here. It was like a few inches of rubber. I did clean those big chunks off, but I'm still doing pretty good. This is just a few years. Look, it's free undercoating. You need that on plastic surfaces. All right, now we're just tracing it back the same way they had it over the differential and it went this way. Then they had it running on top of the subframe connector and along all these factory lines. You guys wanna see something crazy that I just realized? See that gigantic pipe? It's right here, it's, it's massive. It's about the same size as this. That's the factory fuel feed line. I don't know why they didn't just use that. It's literally the same size as this hose and it runs along the car beautifully. I mean, look at this. They, they are just running this next to this. Huh. Look, it's too late. I'm not doing anything about this because we already made the steel braided line. It's gonna work just fine. But did these new edge Mustangs have a fuel system that could support, I mean, the lines like 1200 horsepower? It looks that way. And they have a full return going to the tank as well, which they did utilize on this build. So this uses the factory return all the way back to the tank. Crazy. That's my British fuel line. I'm gonna route this under the AC line. I think that's how they had it. Oh, look at that. Perfect length. Yes. All right, and we'll screw it right on. Righty, tighty, lefty, loosey. You guys know how this goes. I'm gonna tighten this up. We have two more little fuel lines to make under the hood. Then we're good. So these are the two fuel lines that we need to replace under the hood because they are leaking. They're totally dry rotted and the fuel will just seep out from all along the hose. And for this, just because it's what came in the mail right away, we are gonna be doing the PTFE hoses and these are much smaller. So the inside diameter is the same, but the outside diameter isn't. So it's kind of cool. It'll be a little bit more sleek and stealth under the hood, but also we got our cool red and blue fittings. Now the main difference between the installation of these fittings onto the PTFE hose would be this collar right here, which they call the olive. First step is to slide this part over the line and then it is time for our olive which is going to go right underneath the stainless and on top of the actual hose in there and they do make a really nice tool that you can fit in here so that you can push it in but i just have the dash six dash eight size i don't have the dash four but that's fine you can push it in with your hand and then if you go right up against a table you can push it down even further and you know you've pushed it on far enough when the inside liner the actual hose butts up to the inner race of this collar it will stop completely and then you know you're in perfectly. Now, in this case, I am gonna put the fitting inside of here. I'll show you why here in a minute. If you remember last time we put this in the vise and then screwed this into the line, the difference here is that this nut is not stationary like before. So we'll lubricate this. You can use engine oil too, if you'd like. And then we simply slide this on. Now we can bring the nut in and spin it on. And then we just tighten it up with a wrench. Give it a good snug up right there and we're good. And there you go, PTFE fitting is on. And I think these are actually more fun to do. And I think a little easier too, even though you have the collar, you're just sliding this over the braid. So as far as fraying goes and trying to get the line into the other fitting, it's just, it's easier. Now, before I go and install those two fuel lines, we need to take the blower off and the intake off again. Kind of stinks, but let me show you why I messed something up. You guys see this timing cover bolt slash stud and that supercharger pulley? They're, they're not touching or anything, but they are very, very close. See that right there? That's the gap. And the old engine had this bolt here, this Allen head bolt, so it doesn't get in the way. And I, I forgot. So I'm an old Vortec blower pro at this point. We're gonna move the coolant tank out of the way. And this radiator hose too. And we'll just stuff this guy right over here. There you go. Oh, this is such a tight fit. The blower to this intercooler tube. There we go. Let's pull this pipe out of here. So this is the pipe that has our blow off valve, which will be vented to the atmosphere. So we should get some kind of when we let off the gas. And also this will be slightly open when we're just driving around normally under vacuum. And what's nice about having the blow off valve right here, right off the outlet of the supercharger is that it's gonna be bleeding off hot air before it goes into the intercooler. So that's really nice while we're driving around town, we're not sending a bunch of hot air to heat soak the intercooler. So it's good to have the blow off valve here. This car actually had two, but we're going down to one. I think that's totally unnecessary. This is, this is all we need for 
blowing off pressure. I'm gonna slide the belt off of the water pump. It's always easiest to do. So I'm loosening up the tensioner with my right hand. Slide off. There we go. Ah, don't crush my fingers. Ow. Ah, jeez. Okay. So you actually have to remove the supercharger to replace this belt, it, it kind of stinks. Now we just have about four or five supercharger bolts with this bracket, the whole thing comes out together. At least I found that to be the easiest way. Okay, I've got all the blower bolts loose, but not out. I wanna see if I can sneak this. Let me pull it back like that. Oh, now I can get the wrench on there. Oh yeah, this would be so nice if I don't have to take this blower out again. Okay, we're never using this again. So I don't really care about the stud. I was able to loosen it. Don't run into the blower pulley. Oh no. No, no, it's too long. You gotta be kidding me. I'm not giving up. I'm gonna loosen these bolts up till there's one thread left because there's washers on the inside. It's a pain in the butt to line everything back up. I don't wanna do it. Come on, yes, yes. <laughs> I beat you, Vortec blower. I got it out. <laughs> now let's see, can I fit the new one in? Where's the new one? Please fit. Oh, no problem. Are you kidding me? Get out of town. Look at that. I'm like a, a blower ninja of old Vortec blower ninja. We'll come in here with a ball head, see if we can tighten this up. No problem. All right, cool. That's all fine and dandy, but check this out. If we put the supercharger back in place, see how close the pulley is to the alternator. And look what happened to the old alternator, the pulley just kind of clearance itself. I think we can easily remedy this by just shaving this little rib down and one on the bottom from the alternator. It's not actually touching yet, but why risk it? I'm gonna go ahead and slide this back. Get my Hannibal Lecter mask on and this. Much better. Now we actually have clearance there. We should be good. I can't get this anywhere near that bottom part. And uh, so I'm gonna spend probably about the same amount of time it would take me to remove the blower with a file by hand to shave this down. So I'm just, I'm stubborn like that. Us Italians can be stubborn. I did it, the bottom part is shaved down and now we have all the room in the world, we're good. I'm just kidding, I know it's really tight tolerance in there, but that's gonna be good enough because both of these parts are stationary. The alternator's not moving. The pulley's obviously spinning, but it shouldn't be spinning like this. Uh, and even if we were able to get more clearance, which is impossible, if the pulley let loose, it's gonna ram a jam up against everything anyway. So let's blow away some of this metal. I'll bolt this bad boy back on and we are moving on. Before this Cobra hits the road, I gotta get these awesome 03, 04 deep dish Cobra wheels on and take a look at this. So if we just run them as is, we have these ugly studs sticking out because when this car was at the track, the person who built it was running some kind of weld wheel or something, some kind of drag, probably 15 inch wheel, and it required the longer studs. I never got those wheels with the car, so I'm getting rid of these studs because we're gonna run these with these 315 drag radials. I'm sure this car will hook up pretty well. And this was an independent rear suspension car from the factory, but they put a solid axle in the back and it's got some superior axles in the USA. These Ford rear ends were always beefy. I'll give you that, Ford. You make a good rear end. I got a Ford nine inch in my Trans Am. So we need to remove these brake calipers. And aside from a little surface rust, the brakes are in pretty good shape in the rear. Wow, those actually broke free pretty easily. I'm using a wrench. All right, let's get this little caliper out of the way. There we go. Then we have caliper brackets. I'm just gonna rest my head here. Oh, oh, I got it. I gotta say, not bad, not bad, guys. I was expecting worse. Piece of cake. All right, there are washers, I guess, for this bracket. Fun. I say, guys, this is, a, this is a miracle. What? Are you kidding me? That, that just came off too easy. There's, there's no anti-seize or anything. It's great. Now I'm gonna remove this dust shield, also in excellent condition. And removing this will help us get the long studs through. And so we won't be reusing these studs. We're just gonna use a hammer to pound them out. They're pressed in. There you go, usually doesn't take too much force. When you're hitting it out, be careful so you don't destroy the tone ring for the ABS. But check this out. Unfortunately, I can't just slide this out. Look at how close it is. That's crazy, I'm right there. Wait, can I do it? 
Oh, no, I don't want to force it. You don't want to mess that tone ring up. This is no big deal, though. We'll shave a little flat spot in this. Okay, was that enough? Nope. Ah, shaved it down a little bit. Should be good, there we go. Get out, okay. And we're just going with the factory wheel studs and these should go in a lot easier. Yep, they just slide right in. You can use engine oil for this too, but I'm gonna use some penetrating oil for lubrication. And there is a special tool for this, but if you don't wanna buy that, you can use a couple of big washers or nuts in this case. And only if you're not gonna reuse the original lug nuts can you use this as a tool. So I'm going to be swapping these out for some nice chrome ones and some of these were garbled up. So we're gonna use this as a tool, nice and snug in there. And now we're gonna draw it in. factory stud. We're gonna clean all the penetrating oil off. There we go. And these are hardened studs. So as long as you're using good lubrication, you're not gonna destroy the threads. You can also press these in. It's kind of a more proper way to do it if you have the axle out or they do have tools for that as well. But here is our new lug. Threads are in perfect condition. We are good to go. All right, I have four more here, five more on the other side, and then we'll, we'll put the Cobra wheels on. It's gonna look so good. All the wheel studs are done, brakes are back on, and I did wanna just replace the rear brakes, but I'm not sure exactly what they are. So the pads do match up with a Mustang GT, but the rotors do not. I can't find the specific rotor. I'm not exactly sure what's going on. I'll have to look into that more, but we'll just see how it cleans up after our first drive as well. But this is looking good, and I do need a little bit of a spacer, just a five mil. There we go. I'm going with the 315s and everybody on the forum says just to run a little spacer so you don't run into rubbing issues like this. New wheels going on. So excited. Oh, oh. oh yeah, we should have plenty of clearance even when it goes down, but look at this. Chrome Cobra five spokes with the deep dish. So these are replica wheels. The original 0304 Cobra had the spokes flush, but I love a little bit of a dish. I like my wheels like I like my pizza. Deep dish. Do you guys like deep dish pizza? I know that's a little controversial. Some people don't even consider it pizza. I think it's amazing, especially the real Chicago deep dish. But even my family from Italy, when they fly in, they love the deep dish pizza, but they're like, this, this isn't pizza. This is more like a gigantic pie. And I'm like, yeah, I guess you're right. In the front, they did retain the factory 1999 Cobra brakes, which is good because these are actually kind of low. You can see the pad life there. And in the back, everything is, is really nice. So we're going to replace these right now. Hang on. Let's be super efficient while we do the brakes. This air filter could be drying after a nice cleaning because it kind of needs one. So I'm spraying the cleaner in the pleats right now. I'm just going to use this cheap brush to get all of the cobwebs off while the cleaner soaks in for a few minutes. This thing's looking better already. Time for water and always do this from the inside out so you're not pushing any of the dirt further into the pleats. I didn't realize this filter was blue, but look at that. Super clean now, we'll let it dry for a few hours and then we'll oil it later after the brakes. Let's hope this brake caliper comes off as easy as the one in the rear. So far so good. And are these actually any bigger than a normal Mustang GT brake caliper? Did they just put Cobra on there and call it a day? I couldn't imagine the brakes being much smaller on the GT. GT guys, let me know. Is this about one Alex hand size worth of caliper on your car? Oh, it broke loose. Yay. Cobra slash GT caliper coming off. There we go. He still had a few track passes left in him. Are we not gonna get that lucky? Let's see if these will pop off. Oh yeah, no problem. Just a little love tap, that's all. Wow, these studs are so long. These are the wheels, by the way, that this car had on it when it was at the track, and that's why it needed these really long wheel studs. This is something I see a lot on these abandoned vehicles when you get the brakes off. If they have ABS sensors and reluctor wheels, you'll see a lot of garbage in here and you definitely want to clean this out while you're in there. So a little brake parts cleaner and some air. Oh, it's beautiful. It's gonna pick up all the wheel speed. Oh, and our wheel bearings are in excellent condition. No play at all. These wheel studs are gonna come out the exact same way. 
very easy. And let's see. Oh, look at that. They cleared everything. Awesome. This is gonna take like 10 minutes. Sweet. Just like that, they out. Ah, get out of here, spider webs. Never ends. If you really lubricate this, they go in so nice. New wheel studs are on, and now it's time for the new rotor. This thing's actually pretty big. I like it. We don't want our brakes to squeak, so I've lubricated the back of the pads, and now we can just put these guys in here. I already compressed the pistons. There we go. All right, now we can slide our caliper and pads in here. There we go. And just like that, we have new brakes on this side, and of course on this side as well, and there is a little pin at the bottom that holds the caliper on there. So brakes are done, we're getting there. Well, I'm glad we got this running in the last video because I just found that we have an engine oil leak from this hose, most likely. The fitting here is, is bad, so we gotta get this off. I will lose a little bit, but yeah. I gotta fix this. All right, so unfortunately, these are not AN fittings, but I have a hydraulic shop not too far from here. I'll bring them this hose and we'll get a new one back in like a day. With the blower all back together and pulleys not hitting other parts of the engine, we need to tackle this air intake tube. So this is gonna be a pressurized tube right off of the intercooler going to the throttle body. And this did not have a mass airflow sensor, but now that we've eliminated the MAP sensor that was used for the standalone, we need to put a mass airflow sensor in here instead. Now, in talking with the tuner, he recommended the mass airflow sensor to be right about here, and that's because this is in a very straight piece of pipe, which is important so we don't have turbulence before the mass airflow sensor. That way, it'll get an accurate reading of what kind of air is going into this engine. Now, luckily, this adapter to the pipe is a bolt-on piece, so if we remove this, we should be able to screw it into that. These have wonderful tamper-proof torques that you are able to tamper with. Big air coming out. And a couple of Allens for the adapter. This just slides off, so we need to make a hole like that. I'm gonna grind off this paint, so I wanna put a little mark in here. There we go. That'll help us drill as well. Wow, that comes off really nice and easy. Sweet. So here's the adapter piece on our pipe. Everything looks good, except from what I've found, these are one size fit all, but this is a little wobbly. Oh, okay, there it goes. Um, I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna try something. We're gonna try and bend this. I put it in the vise. This is aluminum, so we're gonna heat it up right in this little bridge area, and then I'll slowly tighten the vise and see if we can bend it just a little bit. I think it would seal as is, but I'd like to see this wrap around the pipe a little bit better. All right, so I'm gonna crank down on the vise. And here we go. It's hard to tell, but I think that is bowing a little bit. Oh yeah, look at that. See the little crown right there? I mean, it's very small. We just need a little bit of movement here. I'll keep doing this and heating up and we'll see how it fits. I've tightened this down a few times. Oh, look at that, definitely. It's like a little mini bridge now. It's definitely moved. All right, I've let this cool off for a bit. Let's see. Oh, that is way better. There's still a little bit of a rock, but that's how it was on the other pipe too. And the most important part is that it seals right in here, which we shouldn't have an issue with. Okay, we want our adapter right there. We'll use our center punch again. This way we'll have an exact spot to drill in for the mounting holes. Before we tap, we have to drill. Okay. Yeah, definitely a good reason to wear eye protection and face protection. That drill bit could go flying anywhere and they just they just break sometimes. So here's a new one. Hopefully we're gonna be good on this. There we go. Much better drill bit too. Now we need to cut some new threads. So I matched up the hardware with a tap. Just wanna make sure this is going in straight. Take your time. Make sure it's the right size too. There are charts all over the internet to tell you what size drill bit to use. There we go. We've just bit in. Very nice. And then just run the tap all the way through like that. And then we'll back it out. And just like that, we got brand new threads. Let's double check this screws in nicely. Oh yeah, perfect. All right, I'll do the other one. All right, so I have the one side bolted in. We'll get this screw in as well. All right, tighten it up pretty nice. Sweet. The reason I mounted this on first is so we can drill this directly in the center exactly where we want it. I'm eventually gonna use a stepper bit, but we gotta start somewhere. And right now I'm actually using left-hand drill bits from Harbor Freight. 
Man, they are cutting like butter. Right, that was the biggest one I got, so let's move on to a stepper bit. Come on now. Ooh, this thing's working pretty good too. I've gone as far as I can with the stepper bit without risking getting into this surface here, which we need to keep intact because that's where the O-ring for the mass airflow sensor seals. So it's all by hand from here on out with a die grinder. This actually removes the steel in short order. Look at that. Very nice. All right, we have a perfect circle now into our pipe. And now the mass airflow sensor will drop in. We'll get a couple screws. And just like that, we have installed a mass airflow sensor adapter into a pipe without welding. I find this hilarious. SET calls this their big air math meter and their logo for all of this is an arrow. So they have an arrow there and an arrow there pointing this way. This is a mass airflow sensor meter that needs to point this way. So like they could have, I don't know, picked like a different logo in this particular situation or just not put these. It's, it's confusing. This is where the air needs to go. If you did it the other way around, it would be bad. Like your engine wouldn't run. It would be horrible. Like, come on. Since the intake tubes didn't look the best or match at all, I removed some of the old paint, shot them with some high temp primer, and then a few coats of satin black. They look a little bit better now and they all match. So while they dry, let's go fix that leaking oil line because I got a new oil feed hose made for 33 bucks, about 10 minutes away from the shop. So that's pretty nice. And I even got a brand new shiny fitting. So this will just go on right here, ready. Tidy, get on there. As I, I'll try and hold the camera. There we go. Got it. Here are the new fuel lines that go to the rail and then attach to the regulator. So these are the returns, the new ones that we just built, the, the PTFE or polyglycosamine therapnoid thylomaline. I, I don't remember what it was. I have the adapter piece cleaned up. I'm gonna put a little bit of RTV on the inside just to make sure we get a good seal. Although they didn't use anything on the other pipe. Now we're gonna place that there and get our screws in. All right, snugged up, sealed up. So nice. Airflow that way. We'll reinstall our mass airflow sensor. Mass airflow sensor is installed and we get to go into this tube right here and into this Ford throttle body. Okay, we'll tighten that up. Plug this guy in. This is the pipe with the blow off valve that connects the blower to the intercooler. And then we got one of these doohickeys. That's a shimmy in here to make stuff fit. It's a tight fit. Precision. That's what I like to call it. Get on there. You will comply. It finally complied. I needed to force it with a screwdriver, but it, it agreed to go on. Willingly. I took the blow off valve off to get that to go. I'll plug that in, fit it right in here. This will blow off to atmosphere. Okay. Last up is a freshly painted intake. This is the one that gets the air filter in the fender. And it kind of goes in like this, twists down like so. I clean this up a little and then it gets an elbow piece right to the blower. No restrictions whatsoever on this intake. It's a pretty nice system right here. There we go. And our freshly cleaned air filter sits in like that. This is what it looks like all buttoned up. So the air filter is protected from the elements from not only the front bumper, but the inner fender liner. This is a very important part of the car because the air filter is situated right here. Without it, you could suck up water and hydro lock. This is hydro lock apparently. The last chrome Cobra wheel is going on. It's all coming together. Full wrap all. I don't know about forever, but for a long time. The car is not fully lowered just yet, but here she is with the new wheels and tires. Oh, this is so perfect for a Cobra. I love it. Although I don't, I don't know what, what this Z, whatever that thing says, I gotta, I gotta get rid of that. The rear say SVT, which is much better. Next, we're replacing the hob switch because I stole the one from the Cobra for my CL65. AMG, but this is a switch that when the circuit is completed, will send power to a booster pump in the back, which sends more voltage to the fuel pump 
for more power when you need it. And this just gets installed right in this general area. It's hard to see, but on the side of the throttle body is a boost reference. I had to cut in some new connectors for the hob switch, but there it is, fully installed. Oh, and something that I covered in my last update video is the ECU harness. So if you saw the harness video, you know that I had to take apart the original ECU harness and fix a bunch of hacked up wiring. Well, unfortunately, that was not good enough. I discovered it was missing a plug that looked just like this. It just was hacked completely out. And then after looking through the wiring schematics, there were so many wires that were the wrong colors going to the wrong pins. It was a gigantic nightmare to try and figure out. So for like 140 bucks, I found another ECU harness from a 99. GT automatic that just fixed everything. I already installed it since I did a bunch of wiring in that video. I didn't want to bore you with just running harnesses, but it's in there and it's good. Or at least I hope it's good. All of the colors for the wires matched up. Everything clicked right in and lined up perfectly. So we should be good. Thumbs up. And I know, Alex, why didn't you go with an aftermarket ECU and aftermarket harness and all that stuff? I've covered this. It's like $2,800 and these harnesses are like 100 plus shipping. So there is a gigantic price difference and I don't, I just don't need a standalone with this car. It's just not, it's not that crazy of a car. Something I've been doing over the last few days is just adding coolant, kind of letting it bleed itself out. And we're pretty much at the top, just a little bit left. We should be good on coolant. All right, and then after the brakes, I did flush out all of the brake fluid so it is nice, pretty, and clear. This is where we're at. Everything is buttoned up and it's just ready, ready to start. And I'm ready to drive it as well. I hope the car is. So we're gonna fire this up, let it run for longer than we ever have because I've only let this run for maybe like 20 seconds at a time. The first time, I think it was running off half the cylinders because of the engine harness. So hopefully it runs much, much better. And we have all of the sensors connected. All the fluids are in, everything is done. So we, we should be good. Famous last words. All right, here we go. Wow, fired right up! Woo oh yeah! Yeah. Alright, I had to step away. It's so loud over there. I've let it run for a minute. Uh, it's kind of idled down a little bit. It's running really well. I'm going to go around, check the fluids and all that. Trans level. That's the trans level right there. It's a bow and arrow. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, the car's killing me and I'm a little sick. And then we're gonna drive it. This is drive. Oh, this is a trans dipstick. Yeah, it's a little low. I guess that how much went in, so I'll have to add a little bit. Oil pressure is fantastic. The battery's charging. We're all good there. It's got about 10 inches of vacuum. Fuel pressure's looking decent. I can't adjust that as well. And I mean, this thing is a race car. Listen. Oh man, it's music to my ears. Yes. The blower sounds awesome at idle. The belt looks good. So far, so good. No smoking, nothing. Let's see, do we have pressure yet? A little bit, a little bit. Filling the transmission is horrible. We just have this really tiny fill hole. We have to spend a long time doing this. We don't spill it everywhere. Yay. We're good on the transmission fluid level. It's going up. I just want to look over everything. And we're going to laser gun stuff. Laser! We don't have any leaks. Our new oil line right there is doing good. And yeah, open headers. Very, very loud. So I'm going to check the temperature of each individual primary to make sure that the engine is firing properly because if it's not, they'll be at a different temperature. 30, 40. There's no smoke coming out of the exhaust at all. We're ready to go, guys. It's a beautiful day, too. Oh, I forgot. This thing's got hood vents. Ah. Race car. That's something I would not do. I don't, I don't like that. Not a fan. I know why they did it, though. The whole intercooler system. And it works. Let's go. All right, first time. Put it in gear. Oh, and it actually rolls. That's great. <laughs> yes. Some more wiring goodness that I didn't show was that we had to repin some of the transmission harness because this transmission's out of like a 97 
Mustang or something. So many differences, guys. I had no idea. All right, we got reverse too, by the way. That's good. Oh, 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 okay. Base tune, it's okay. My neighbors love me. Yes, they do. I, I, I don't know, guys, how this claw, this bear claw is supposed to work. Does this just hook into you and then you're secure? This is insane. That worked on old school cars, but yeah, this, this is crazy. I'm buckled, I'll be safe. Alright, here we go, people. <laughs> oh, this alignment is it's very bad. Very bad. be shifting out of first. Definitely what it sounds like, I'm sure to you guys. Alright, I can't I can't go crazy. It's like completely untuned. We just have a bass tune right now. It's not overheating, the oil pressure's good. It's definitely got a big stall converter. And that guy just honked at me. Right there. <laughs> All right, guys, we're going back. Uh, I don't think it's shifting. I've gotten up to like 25. Everything else feels fine. I mean, the alignment is off, but the brakes feel good. Uh, you know, steering, everything like that's good. So, yeah, we got some kind of trans issue, but it doesn't overheat. It's been running now for like 30 or 40 minutes. So, yeah. Yay. We have first, we have reverse. It runs and it drives. And my mic's about to, yeah. <laughs> and it looks like this with its fake Cobra R spoiler and its awesome red paint that definitely needs a buff. But I love the look, the stance, everything with the new wheels. You could tell how bad the alignment is, but here it is at another angle. So nothing's sticking out. And that's how I like it. We put the legit streetcar's front license plate on because it was already drilled in. Yeah, I hate when they do that, but 
you know. It's been a long time coming, but the Cobra's back. After 21 years of essentially being abandoned after an engine issue, the fastest Cobra in the world for a couple of years in the early 2000s. Some would say the good old days at this point, if you're, if you're getting old like myself. But yeah, ladies and gentlemen, there she is. I still have a ton of work to do as usual, and I'm sure lots of other things will come up that will need to be addressed, but this is a big leap. One small step for Alex kind and one large step for Legit three quarters. I don't know, guys. I'm, I'm, I think I'm a little bit woozy from the fumes, but the car is alive. That's what I'm trying to get at, and I'm very happy and excited, and I hope you guys are too. I hope you really enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a big thumbs up. Share the video with your friends. Subscribe if you haven't already. Most importantly, have a fantastic day, and I'll see all of you in the next one. So here's my fuel line building station, EV batteries and van transmission. And um, uh, yeah. some instructions will show, some, in some instructions will show you putting this, some instructions, there are many, there are many different ways you can, there are many ways, there are, and here, and here's the rest, and here's my pot. But it's too late, I'm not doing anything about this because we already built this line, but, Look, it's too late. I'm not doing anything about this ever. Look, it's too late. I'm not. Now there's a special tool for, what are these called, wheel studs? I find this hilarious. SCT calls this their big air math re, yeah. I find this hilarious, big air. Yay. <sighs> All right, there we go. That gives you more control over your car. That gives, I don't even know what I'm saying.